Thank you, everybody. Uh, persistent memory, I, I've been involved in persistent memory at HPE about, for about two years now. My involvement has primarily been readying the platforms for the incorporation of persistent memory. And you'll begin to see the fruits of our labor here, and I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, there's also a peer of mine back home that's been working with the software ecosystem, our ISVs and OSVs partners, um, readying the software for the insertion of persistent memory. And we'll, show, we'll walk through what's interesting about it. So persistent memory is a, is a very overloaded term. Within HPE, we've made the decision that to be a product or an offering under the persistent memory umbrella, you have to have three characteristics. At first, the obvious one is you have to remain state or maintain state at the loss of power. The second, it has to be directly accessible by the CPU. Okay? And the third, it has to be byte addressable. So hopefully, you can see certain products clearly don't fit in that umbrella, like an SSD or a hard drive, because those don't meet those requirements. So that's our definition, and that's what we're going to go forward with. So what's interesting here is I want to show a little bit what's happened in time and why it is a revolutionary change rather than an evolutionary change. So on my graph here, I have latency on my vertical graph, on my vertical axis, and on my horizontal axis, I have general calendar time. And I have two primary trends, the top one, which is hardware, and the bottom one is software. And my top, work, top trend, I start with the hard drives, right? They've been the workhorse of storage for many, many years. They've been making evolutionary changes. They've been getting faster, smaller, cheaper, all the good stuff that they should be doing on an evolutionary path. They're still the cheapest uh, storage device available within the server, right? The dollars per gigabyte, they, they win every single time. Then came along the SSDs. And from a performance standpoint, they were revolutionary relative to the performance of a hard drive. So they cause um, changes in behavior and software. And you can see that um, with the changes in the, in the drivers and the uh, Linux kernel and various aspects of accessing it. And you go one step further, we go to persistent memory. Persistent memory relative to SSDs from a performance standpoint is revolutionary again. We've got two orders of magnitude in performance. And I'll put it into position to be the highest, actually the lowest dollars per IOP, anything that you can get in a server, when, right? So for a performance standpoint, it's, it's, it's very impressive, right? So why is this in, so impactful to the software? Because the latency of the persistent memory now is beginning to approach latencies of DRAM, and you can't afford the, the software stack ups that are traditional in block I.O. So you see my software trajectory curve the block I.O. has been making evolutionary changes to improve itself to adapt to the changes in the hardware, from the, the block I.O. type of hardware. But persistent memory requires a pretty significant software change to get the multiple layers of software out. You can imagine when you access a, you know, in 0.1 microseconds, basically 100 nanoseconds, persistent memory, you can't have a whole lot of software in the way between the application and its, and its cell. So, the reason why this is critical, because now you can start imagining going forward what happens when you can do real-time changes the data and it's instantly persistent. It changes completely how you think about your solutions. So our early partners in this space here are been the database companies, and we've been focusing primarily on the write log acceleration, basically um, on write combining and then accelerating non bottle memories. And you get very significant amount of performance improvement with a very little investment in persistent memory. If you take that, that thought process and then apply it to HPC and think what you can do, right? It's, it's huge. The way you do checkpointing, the way you want to keep your, your data persistent is totally different. You can take out thousands and thousands of lines of code and time, right? So efficiency goes up significantly. So we talked about had a software partner back home because this is an evolving technology, there's really three buckets of way it's presented to the application. The very first one is the classical block model. We have to do that for legacy points of view. Right? The software overhead is terrible relative to the performance of the persistent memory, but there's still value in some applications and using that. One is simple, hey, it's a block device, I can use it today. My application take, gets some advantage from it. Going, next, going over to the on the right, as we call the indirect PM model. This one here, the application is semi-aware of persistent memory. It's not aware of the nuances of persistent memory. It has libraries to call. There's a, you know, if you've been following along with DAX, uh, Microsoft also has a solution. There's an MVL library available as well. 
and start using the persistent memory. So, the modifi so there were modifications to the application at this point of view, right? And then you go one step further to the very far right is the application is fully aware of the nonviolent memory. In that case, it, it begins to start talking directly to nonviolent memory. You, you get, take advantage of the 100 nanosecond, 200 nanosecond access latencies, right? So it makes a big, big, big difference. I think that's all I want to cover there. And, and, and I guess I want to point out the very left here, and I call the indirect stuff. I hope people understand that when you access through the block I.O. path today, that is an indirect access, meaning the CPU cannot directly access the media. It has an intermediary that's moving the data on its behalf, right? It's moving it from the drive to memory, and then the device, then the CPU talks to the memory. It's very, very valuable for very large block moves, right? That's not going to go away. Persistent memory won't replace that. On the other hand, if you want to manipulate the data very quickly in very fine granularities, right, persistent memory is the key, is, is, is key winner in that space, right? And an example I give, can you imagine um, if you had two terabyte object and you want to manipulate every other or every 27th byte, right? Doing that through a block I.O. would be terrible. On the other hand, if it's in persistent memory local to the CPU, you could do that very quickly, real time, no interruptions whatsoever. Um, the other point I wanted to make, what was it here? Um, I think that is sufficient for now. And we'll go, th in the latter, last slide I have, I do have a slide showing, showing you pointers to the various software that's available. You will note, as I talk about the fruits of our labor, we announced our, our DL380 uh, about two weeks ago, supporting persistent memory. Then you also will see, or should have seen, Microsoft announced their 2016 software products supporting non-volatile memory, and they demoed it on top of a DL380 client. Right? So the ecosystem and the hardware is moving forward. The challenge now is get the applications adapted and exploiting what it can actually go do. Now, on the hardware side of point of view, all persistent memory, and the definition that I use, is not created equal. Everything in the slide here, don't, don't, don't be afraid, is all public information and some guesswork on my part about where things will play out, right? But in general, there's the, the, this term that we coined two years ago called, called universal memory. That was our flag plant. That was our goal. Our attempt was to get persistent memory at DRAM performance, right? That's it, which is my horizontal axis, at SSD cost, which is my vertical axis. And the reality is we missed that boat in our first incarnation of persistent memory. However, there's still great value to be had with persistent memory. Our goal is still to hit that um, target if we can get there, right? That's the industry's challenge to get to. So we're going to offer ProLiant itself. We made the investment and the commitment to make it the best persistent memory platform in the world. That's our goal. And the persistent memory show up here, there's a continuum of offerings. The very first offering that HP announced is the star above DRAM. It's, it's equivalent and performant to DRAM. It's more costly than DRAM, but it's persistent. That's the one where we saw a lot of value in terms of write log accelerations um, in very small quantities, meaning when you put eight gigabytes of that in there, the, the improvement in performance in a write intensive application sometimes is 4x, right? It's significant, right, for a very small investment relative to the cost of the server. It's very interesting. All right, as we go into my gray blobs, and these are just guesses from public information, right? This is where we think the, it's gonna be, be a category of persistent memory we call, I'm calling capacity, right? It's not gonna have the performance of DRAM, but it's, but it's not gonna be as costly as DRAM, and the performance is actually very good, right? So if you look at my curve here, it's kind of this blob in the middle. Right? And then you're gonna see, even though the, the cross point three, cross point up here, SSD won't be categories as persistent memory, you will see the technology, the memory technology used in SSDs to make very, very fast SSDs. Okay. Hopefully that makes some kind of sense as we go through here. And this is my last slide. I was told to keep this very short and very brief, an amount of time actually. Is there's actually additional cap collateral out there available, and, and not just what HP is doing, but, um, but this is HP-centric. There's some cute little um, YouTube videos out there that are interesting to watch about persistent memory, it gives you a little background. Um, we do have an SDK for the Linux world out there. There is a link for it there. And there's additional name. Brett Gibbs is really the product marketing individual, so if I don't have an answer, um, if I can answer questions, we can go to him and get him more information. But please, if you have questions, ask. I'll be around for the rest of the day. 
Um, my email address is joe.foster at hp.com, hpe.com, I'm sorry. So we can uh, do whatever you need. There is, you saw Microsoft's offering, there are other ISVs, OSVs, Prime to launch. It's just a matter of time when they get their products out. So the world is, is converging on persistent memory. Please, you know, take advantage of it, and I'll open it up to questions. I think I see hesitation in questions. Do you have questions? Either I'm very good or very bad. All right. Thank you. <laughs>